the, the third um, event taking place. And uh, warm welcomes again from, from Florida um, at, our, at our HQ in, in the US. Um, not many housekeeping rules this morning. Uh, you know where your bathrooms are. Um, you know where to get uh, a, a cold drink or a warm drink if you're up north in the, in the country, but if it's pretty cold up there. Um, but we are going to be very much entertained and educated for the next hour. Um, and um, Dr. Morris, Dr. Steinberg, you were both looking well, so you must have been keeping very active during this, this lockdown phase. And I'm sure very excited about the, the news of, of states. I know Illinois is um, uh, chomping at the bits to get back into, into, into their normal routines and practices. But um, thank you very much for, for taking this time this morning and, uh, and presenting to us. Um, just a, a quick introduction. Um, Dr. Steinberg received his DDS degree from Northwestern University School of Dentistry and later earned an MD degree from Hanuman University. Is that correct, the pronunciation? Yes, it is. Hanuman University School of Medicine in Philadelphia. He is a board certified by American Board of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. Dr. Steinberg has written articles and textbook chapters in the oral and maxillofacial surgery literature. He has lectured both nationally and internationally on topics in oral and maxillofacial surgery. Prior to entering private practice in 2007, Dr. Steinberg was a full professor of surgery at the Loyola Strift School of Medicine. Presently, he maintains an academic appointment as a clinical professor of surgery and teaches at Loyola University Medical Center. He also maintains a private practice with offices in Northbrook and Lake Forest, Illinois. Does that sound pretty correct, Dr. Steinberg? Yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Morris, uh, he completed his undergraduate studies at Indiana University in, in Bloomington, Indiana, and received his dental degree from the University of Illinois at Chicago and completed his residency in prosthodontics at the UMKC College of Dentistry in Kansas City, Missouri. Dr. Morris is currently president of the Illinois section of the ACP. Dr. Morris has lectured both nationally and internationally and has authored or co-authored numerous articles related to dental implants. Dr. Morris maintains a private practice limited to prosthodontics and restorative dentistry in Buffalo Groves, Illinois. I did say I'm going to reduce the, the introduction because we, we want to save time for um, some of the, the clinical, clinical side of this presentation. But um, uh, it does give me great pleasure to, again, welcome everyone as you joined us a little bit later. Uh, today's uh, presentation topic is optimizing outcomes and practice efficiency utilizing site-specific implants, subcrestal angled correction, and short wide dental implants. Under the current uh, climate, I think it's a very pertinent topic for business owners on how to more efficiently uh, and be in a position to grow their practices by introducing new techniques to help their patients. Dr. Steinberg and Morris will discuss the importance of a team approach, very important, and the collective decisions made to help their patients and the ability to streamline procedures. Gentlemen, um, I'd like to, great pleasure to introduce the two of you and uh, it's all yours, the stage is yours. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good, good evening, evening. If, that, if that's appropriate. Uh, I'm Mark Steinberg and okay, this is Morris. Uh, and today we're going to talk about improving our outcomes and practice using site-specific implants. Uh, we both have some disclosures to make um, relations with other companies. However, today, neither of us are receiving any financial support for this lecture. So today, we're going to talk about site-specific implants. And specifically, we're going to talk about two different ones. We're going to talk about subcrestal angled implants, a type of angled implant that we'll talk about. And then we're going to talk about wide body implants, both for the posterior arches and for the anterior region as well. And we're going to talk about how this has impacted our practice in terms of improving outcomes, shortening treatment, and uh, improving patient comfort. So let me start off, I want to talk about angulated implants in general. 
Um, a number of years ago, implant dentistry had a game changer and that was incorporating the use of an implant angled. And we first employed this probably in uh, full arch cases using the distal implant of a full arch case and we placed it on an angle. And this gave us some advantages. It allowed us to use a longer implant in the distal position because we put it on an angle. And what that did, it increased the ability to get primary stability because it was a longer implant embedded in more bone. And then it decreased the need for a longer cantilever for a full arch case by increasing the AP spread. So it was really a, a very big game changer in terms of full arch cases. And we, we employ that even today. In the anterior region, in the aesthetic zone, we also use an angled implant, but instead of angling it mesiodistally, as we did in the full arch case, we're gonna angle this facially palatally or facially lingually. And this, this illustrates this point. This is an implant in the anterior region. And in order to put the screw channel where the restorative dentist needs it, like through the cingulum of the tooth, I have to have this implant more vertically oriented. And when I have this implant vertically oriented, you can see that there's going to be a fenestration or perforation of the labial bone here. And if that happens, it's going to require bone grafting. And I'm going to have to bone graft either at the time of implant placement or in more severe cases, I'm gonna to have to bone graft in advance, wait for healing, and then, and then place the implant. But if I use an angulated implant, I could have the implant well within the confines of the bone, no fenestration, and we'll correct this angulation with an angle corrected implant and placing the, the uh, screw channel where the restorative dentist needs to do that. So it's really changed the way we do things, even in the aesthetic zone. And what it has done, it obviates the need for having a screw channel. If you place this implant well within the bone, the screw channel will come out of the facial, which nobody likes. Uh, restorative dentists don't like a situation like that. And I'm able to place the implant well within the bone, but angle correct the screw channel with an angle corrected type of an implant, having a screw channel come out of the cingulum where it belongs. It also eliminates the need for angled screw channels. These large screw channels, uh, restorative dentists don't like. There are a lot of problems with that. Yeah, there's a few different issues or concerns that I have with angled screw channels. One is because of the, the, the size of the opening, um, and very often the porcelain gets very, very thin in the middle of it, so it's a little bit more difficult to make aesthetic, uh, especially if uh, the restoration is, is uh, porcelain uh, fused to metal. Um, but you can get some head lighting through zirconia as well. So uh, that, can, that can create some cosmetic issues. And then also some questions about being able to reliably and continually deliver enough torque uh, to, the, uh, to the port of the uh, screw with the uh, head of the screwdriver or uh, the, uh, the screwdriver tip. Um, especially if some debris gets in there, we're not able to access it to clean it. So um, to me, you know, this is, this is a, it's a fix, but it's not the ultimate fix. Yeah, we don't like that. Uh, using angled implants in the aesthetic zone, a lot of times will decrease or eliminate the need for custom abutments. And it eliminates the need for cement retention. Most of these things now are all screw retained. Yeah, and this is a, a big controversy right now. And you know, obviously we have a lot of experience with screw retained implant restorations, but these kinds of things can happen. And when they do, the results can be devastating. And as careful as we are, it's, uh, there, there's really no way we can guarantee that we haven't left well, some cement behind. Right. Um, another great use of angled implants is avoiding maxillary sinus or avoiding maxillary sinus bone grafting or sinus lifting. By using an angled implant in a strategic position, we're able to angle that on either side of the maxillary sinus and make an implant supported bridge, obviating the need for any type of grafting. So that, that works really well. And it decreases the need for zygomatic implants. As much as Dr. Mars and I love doing uh, zygomatic cases, particularly with the Zygan implant. Not every patient wants this and not every patient can really have it. So if we have a patient with a very severe atrophic posterior maxilla, we could still offer them a full arch solution with a, with a large angulated implant. And the, the reality is with the, with Zygan, with the zygomatic implants, th this really completes the, the portfolio of things that we can, that we can provide for our patients. I mean, this, this has been a, an absolute game changer. However, if we can avoid it, it's better. It's, okay. it's better. Uh, angulated implants help use help us put in pterygoid implants, 
We sometimes will angulate the implant into the pterygoid plates in order to get good primary stability. This is a type of case of mine where we anchor it in a pterygoid plate. It's a very, very stable implant, and we have a very nice restoration. Yeah, Dennis did a good job there. So clearly, angulated implants are of a great advantage in implant dentistry, and we use it for many different things. So that's an angulated implant in general. Let's talk now about subcrestal angulated implants and how they're different. So sub subcrestal angle uh, correction is, uh, uh, to me, it's a huge uh, advantage because we're not stacking, the, the angle corrections uh, occurring in the solid part of the implant, we're not stacking an additional piece on top of that. And as everyone on the web, uh, the web webinar knows, we've got 12, 24, and 36 degrees that we can do this with um, in different platforms. Uh, but when you take a look at uh, what we used to do, and Dr. Steinberg talked about increasing AP spread by placing an implant in an angulation, surgically and from the st a stability standpoint, indeed, we do see great advantages. However, when you have the angle correcting implant, uh, the abutments, um, the, the, the abutment screw actually occupies the same space as the retaining screw. So if there's a prosthetic issue with a screw, uh, those can be sometimes difficult to manage. And the second thing we have to look at too is there's two different uh, geometries to the angle correcting abutment. There's the platform in, uh, geometry, which is where the abutment seats to the platform of the implant, and then there's the actual footprint of the abutment. Because the uh, angle correction offsets the uh, restorative platform, it actually makes the footprint of the abutment larger. And so that can create some issues with bone profiling. Sometimes it's difficult to get these abutments seated, especially uh, in, in the uh, uh, posterior areas where we're typically using them. and uh, so the, the, the subcrestal angle correction uh, makes the restorative process significantly easier. If you take a look at uh, photoelastic studies, or uh, uh, you can see uh, strain, the strain on the screw and the strain on the implant. Um, when you have an, an implant that's not angle corrected subcrestally, you'll see more, well, I'm sorry, I went back. We, you'll see more, for, uh, more force in the screw and more force in the neck of the implant or the coronal third of the implant. And so that can create some prosthetic complications uh, like screw loosening or breakage. Uh, but when you see the platform has been shifted or uh, the angle has been cor uh, corrected subcrestally, when the abutment is seated or the crown is seated on the implant, the, it's within the path of insertion of the screw. And so you see less force in the implant and less force in the screw. So uh, we can uh, imply from that that you'll see significantly lower uh, complication rates like loose screw, a loosening of screws or breaking of screws in that circumstance. It also gives us a little bit more tissue uh, to work with. So uh, for the restorative dentists on the line, uh, we all understand that the tissue can become thin here. You can see some recession uh, on the straight implant, on the angle correcting implant, the coaxis implant. We have more bone, more tissue, so we have more prosthetic uh, leverage in terms of being able to create a, uh, an aesthetic restoration. And so that brings us to our first case. This is a patient of ours. He's 60 years old. He uh, had a bicycle accident uh, when he was in his teens, and he uh, fractured eight and nine. Uh, had a fixed uh, uh, partial denture placed from six to 10, uh, endodontic treatment on number seven. And our treatment plan for him was to extract uh, the root tip at nine and graft eight and nine for future implant placement. I removed the existing provisional restoration and uh, put a provision, uh, I'm sorry, the existing fixed bridge and put a, a provisional restoration on and referred uh, the patient to uh, Dr. Steinberg for bone grafting. So as you can see in the radiograph, uh, tooth number nine or the remnant of tooth number nine has been extracted and eight and nine have been grafted. And after the graft had consolidated, we went ahead and uh, started planning our implants. So here you can see the, 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 the uh, uh, radiographic uh, image of the graft in place, a beautiful amount of uh, bone for us to work with. The implant is completely housed in bone, and with the 12 degree angle correction, uh, we're going to have the screw exit between the cingulum and incisal edge. And uh, we used a, a semi guided approach. So the angulation, uh, when Dr. Steinberg placed the implants, uh, was defined by the, uh, the guide. And so we placed two uh, DC coaxis implants, the deep conical connection. Um, and you can see uh, with, within the uh, arch form, uh, the preparations on the uh, canine, the lateral, and the lateral, the implants are uh, directly in line, but the screw exits are coming in uh, towards the cingulum. You'll be able to see that 
here's the mounts, and then um, here we have the custom uh, provisional restoration. So we did not immediately provisionalize uh, these implants. We, uh, I put the provisional restoration back in after making customized healing abutments. Impressions were made uh, in open tray uh, technique with, uh, uh, I customized the uh, impression copings with composite resin. And so we retrieved a soft tissue cast and made our individual restorations. Uh, in this case, I chose to use the passive abutment. So you can see that assembled uh, with the crown as a porcelain fused metal restoration. After the provisional uh, healing abutments or the custom healing abutments were removed, you can see the beautiful sculpting of the tissue and then placement of the final restoration. So this is uh, initial placement of the restorations, a little bit of a dark triangle right now. You'll be able to see this improve over time. Uh, nice emergence after the grafting, nice emergence for the crowns. And you can see that continues, the crowns emerge beautifully out of the tissue. And there's the radiograph, the final radiograph. So uh, this is a more complex case. Uh, we were able to treat it with screw retained implant restorations because of subcrestal angle correction because of coaxis, and uh, we were able to accomplish the goal for this patient. So that worked out real well, thanks. I'm gonna show another case uh, that illustrates this point. This is a 38-year-old female. She had a history of trauma to tooth number nine about 20 years uh, prior. This patient has a story, doesn't she? Yeah, but we're not gonna tell her. Maybe no. we'll tell it in South Africa? Maybe not, Maybe we're okay. getting in trouble. <laughs> anyway, we um, took out number nine. Uh, she fractured number nine, she, and then she ended up getting resorption uh, around the the crown of this tooth to the point where the crown fell off and she walked around holding this crown in with a bleach, bleaching tray and so she came to us for treatment and the first thing we did is remove tooth number nine and that's the removal with the bone graft in place and then we we did some treatment planning with a with a cone beam ct and we identified two problems one was an angulation problem uh, then and one was a soft tissue problem the soft tissue problem, due to the resorption, we lost a lot of marginal keratinized gingiva in this area here that we need to repair for aesthetics. And so our treatment plan, we're gonna correct the angulation problem with a subcrestal angled implant, a coaxis implant with a 12 degree correction. And you can see that the screw emergence is gonna be right through the cingulum in this area. And we're gonna correct the soft tissue problem with a connective tissue graft. And so this is how we did this case. Uh, this is what the tissue reflected. And with the tissue reflected, you can actually see the extent of the soft tissue defect. There's a large clefting defect here that needed to be uh, improved upon. So this is a 12 degree guide pin uh, after we placed, uh, after we drilled the initial two millimeter drill. Uh, this is the placement of the implant. The implant, this is the fixture mount. And so the implant went in on this angle and then there's a 12 degree, degree correction. This is where the, the screw emergence is going to be. You could see that if I didn't use the 12 degree correction, if we just put it at the direction of the implant placement, the screw hole would come out of the facial in this area, which of course we don't want. And so this is the implant after it was placed. You could see that the implant is in good position in line with the cingulum of the adjacent teeth. And this is the connective tissue graft on the day of surgery. And this is the connective tissue graft when the patient came back two weeks later for suture removal. So let's review this case and the outcome. So this is pre-op where the patient had a, a loose crown and, uh, and resorption. This is the day of the implant placement. And this is the uh, implant placed at bone level with a connective tissue graft in place. And then this is Dr. Morris's provisional restoration. Uh, and again, very good bone contour and very good contour of the crown. And this is the results with the provisional. You could see that we had a very nice improvement of the soft tissue. You could see where the defect was, and this is our graft. There's a little bit of a black triangle that will improve over time with tissue molding and with time. We have nice contour. This is the provisional uh, in place. And then Dr. Morris is gonna talk about the prosthodontics. So here, here you can see the result of the tissue contouring with the provisional restoration. So I simply removed it, made impressions of the implant and the adjacent tooth. Um, and in this case, we used a, a, a zirconia core with felt, a layered feldspathic uh, porcelain buildup and uh, again, uh, passive abutment. And so here you can see uh, this is the day of placement of the uh, restoration um, and the final restoration in place. This is initial placement. So here you can see uh, how she presented day of, uh, surgery. Day of surgery with the uh, uh, 
it, it was a pretty significant defect. And right. then you did a beautiful job with that. And then um, this was the initial uh, crown placement. Uh, you can see it, it, it emerges beautifully from the tissue. And here you'll see the pillow completely fills. That's the um, final. That's the final restoration with the pill fill, filled in place. And uh, not, you know, nice stable restoration, holding bone, everything's uh, worked out well for her. So let's talk about wide body implants for the, for the posterior region uh, with that. And Dr. Morris will talk a little bit so, about site specific wide body implants. So commonly we would have a patient come to us for uh, a placement of a restoration impression. And you can see uh, very often the implants are just someplace within the neighborhood. Uh, the implants are too skinny, they're too uh, short. Uh, this patient would have been uh, better treated with uh, sinus elevation and a more appropriate uh, sized implant. So this is not site-specific site, uh, implant therapy. This is just implant therapy. And we can do better than that. This is a case where the patient had the tooth extracted uh, and the implant placed, a max implant placed. We've got much more support of the implant in the bone, a larger platform for the stability of the occlusion. Um, that is a site-specific implant. So... Uh, We've done lots of implant dentistry, like you see on the top left, but uh, the bottom right is a significant improvement. So, you know, commonly a patient loses a tooth and they decide they can live without the tooth for a while. So they disappear and their ridge shrinks. We all know how this goes and uh, they want to have an implant placed and they'll find somebody who will place an implant. It won't be uh, grafted necessarily and the implant will be a standard implant or a smaller implant. And so we end up with this issue here. Um, and selfishly, from the restorative standpoint, you know, the patients will come in and say, well, the imp implant was placed by the surgeon, and the implant's fine, and, and the, they'd be correct. The implant's integrated, but they've got this huge buccal defect, uh, which becomes a, a major food trap, and that's probably the most common complaint I hear from patients with uh, implants in the molar region. Well, molars are big teeth, and we need big implants for big teeth, and in the past, we didn't really have that. Uh, but now we do, and Max has corrected this problem. Uh, in, the, in the mandible and the maxilla, the molars are big. They need big implants. So we're going to talk a little about the indications for these wide body or these max implants. I'm going to go through all these individually. Uh, so let's start off. The, probably the most common use of the max or the wide body implant is to obviate the need for socket grafting. We do immediate implant placements with molar with uh, molar teeth, both in the maxilla and the mandible. So I don't have to do something like this where we do a bone graft and we have to wait a number of months. I do something like this now, where we extract a tooth and immediately replace it with an implant. And in short order, we're into the restorative phase with an impression coping. And Dr. Morris makes a nice crown. And if you look at the angulation of that impression coping, you can see it's absolutely aligned with the compensating curves. So uh, we, we're not dealing with angle, is, angle issues. We're not dealing with uh, skinny uh, platforms. Everything aligns perfectly so that we can eliminate that food trap on the bottom. Yeah, and you don't have that, that defect or that food trap here. Correct. Uh, another, another good use for the max implant is sinus avoidance. Earlier on, I talked about avoiding the sinus with an angulated implant, but sometimes we don't have enough room for a narrow or longer angulated implant. And we could strategically find some bone in the posterior maxilla near the tuberosity where we could put a shorter, wider implant and accomplish the same thing by obviating the need for any type of sinus grafting and making an implant retained bridge. And I'll show you a case that illustrates this point very well. This is a patient of, of Dr. Morris, and I think for many years he was after her to get a sinus lift or a sinus graft in this area so he could restore the, the posterior maxilla. The patient was very resistant to having any type of sinus grafting or any type of surgery. And so we looked for a different option and a different way of approaching this problem. And on CT scan, we were able to find bone for two regular uh, normal southern implants. And we found bone posterior to where the teeth really need to be, but we found bone in the posterior maxilla where I was able to place a shorter, wider implant. And this was our treatment plan. And this is how the procedure was executed. We place two implants in this area. We have a, a gap where the sinus is low, and then we have this in the posterior maxilla. Uh, this is a very recent case. We don't have a slide of the restorative, but pretty soon Dr. Morris will make a nice bridge for her. Yeah, and without Max, this case would never have happened. Right, she would not, she would not take a sinus. No. Uh, with that, 
Even in single tooth implants, we can avoid the sinus. Um, uh, and I'll illustrate it with a couple of cases. This is a patient who was sent to me for extraction of a fractured tooth number three. And when you measure the uh, floor of the sinus, it's quite low. I don't have a lot of bone to, to, to work with here for an implant. And prior to the advent of the um, wide body or the max implant, this would have been an extraction of a tooth, a socket graft at the same day. I'd wait four months and then take a new radiograph. And if, if I had enough bone, I'd place an implant. And if I didn't have enough bone, this patient would have to have a, a crestal or an internal sinus lift, however you like to call it. So she would need at least two bone grafting type of procedures. And that's how I would have handled it years ago. Today, we just take out the tooth and I can put a max implant in. It shortens the treatment time uh, dramatically. Another case that illustrates this point, this is an infected tooth number 14. Same issue, we have a very low sinus floor. There's some atrophy of the alveolar crest. And if you look at this, I don't have a lot of bone to place an implant. And years ago, this would have been a socket graft and then wait, and then maybe an internal sinus lift. But today, it's an immediate placement of an implant, which, which it has a better outcome and I have a better implant in this area. So this is using the, the uh, larger implants for the maxilla, avoiding the sinus, but we use it in the mandible too. And we use it in the, uh, for immediate implants in the mandible. One of the greatest advantages is I could avoid any type of inferior alveolar nerve injury. Prior to using max or wide body implants, I almost never, never put in an immediate molar implant. And the reason is, is that when you put in an immediate molar in the mandible, you have to use a slightly longer implant so you could grab some bone apical to the socket to get some primary stability uh, with that. But if you use a longer implant to get bone apical to the socket, sometimes you end up being into the inferior alveolar canal or even deeper and severing the nerve and you're causing a nerve damage. I never wanted to get into this situation with that. You know, it's interesting. I don't know if uh, you guys are aware, but Dr. Steinberg, one of his particular expertise is in nerve repair. So he, um, and, and sadly we've seen a lot of these cases that have been referred um, to him for uh, nerve repair and I've uh, had the opportunity to restore these patients and they're never happy. No, and I have to tell you, one of the reasons I never put an immediate implant in the molar is I didn't want to be one of my own referring doctors for nerve injury. So, um, uh, but putting a max implant in really has changed the whole game in terms of placing immediate molars. Another advantage of placing a wider body implant for immediate molar mandible placement is that when you use a regular body or narrow body implant for an immediate implant in the mandible, it's either going to go into the distal root socket or into the mesial root socket, neither of which are good. If you put it in the distal, you're going to end up with a large cantilever crown and food trapping underneath. And if you put it in the mesial socket, it's going to be very close to the adjacent tooth and cause periodontal problems. In the future, you're going to cantilever the crown distally. Uh, it's so much better to place a wide body implant in something like that. It's centrally located into the socket. It has a much better platform and emergence and relation to the adjacent teeth. Yep. And a good distance away from the nerve there too. Yeah, it wor works well with the nerve. Yeah. Um, an another great use of uh, wide body implants is for full arch cases. And typically in our practice, instead of doing what people call an all on four or just four implants, we like a fixed on six. And we put implants in the posterior so that we can have a shorter cantilever or no cantilever. And I like to have the, the implants underneath the molars at least so that we have complete occlusal stability. Okay. So when we plan a full arch case, we'll put four implants in the anterior if we can, but we also like to find some bone in the posterior and using a shorter, wider implant, we're able to find some bone and place an implant. So this is treatment planning of a case, and this is how the case was executed. This is exactly like the treatment plan. Um, we have implants in the back. Yes, now in this case, we did not immediately load her implants. She's a, a patient that travels between uh, Chicago and Florida, and like a lot of our patients, they'll come in here in uh, October and November. Those that have evolved to be smarter than we are, they leave for the winter. <laughs> And uh, so we, uh, in the spring, when she came back from Florida, we went ahead and made provisional restorations and continued our treatment. These are temporary pins. A lot of times when we don't immediately provisionalize a case and they leave with a, a removable denture, I'll put these um, 
temporary pins in, so they have a little extra retention with the denture and a little bit happier about wearing a removable appliance. So this is what it looked like on the day of surgery. This is the provisionalization from Dr. Morris, and this is his final uh, prosthesis. And clinically, she has a very, very nice prosthesis, great occlusion, great aesthetics. The patient was very happy with this. This case worked out real well. Very nice. Um, other uses for uh, 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 wide body implants is healed ridges. We talked about putting them in uh, as immediate implants and extraction sockets, but you could put it in a healed ridge as well. And this case illustrates this really nicely. It's a nice case. This is a, a 19 year old boy. I've been treating him through, throughout his adolescence. He came to me in early adolescence with a first molar that would not erupt. And I have to tell you, we did everything to try to get this tooth to erupt. I uncovered it, I, I removed bone, we eventually placed a bracket and a chain and we, we tried to force erupt it. And this tooth didn't move and the only thing that happened is we lost anchorage and this tooth tipped into the space. And now the patient is 19 and this tooth is not going anywhere. So we decided it's time to remove the tooth and replace it with an implant. And so what I did is I removed the tooth, which was not an easy thing. And we bone grafted the socket. And while the bone graft was healing, I had the orthodontist uh, upright uh, this molar tooth uh, during the four months while this bone graft was healing. And when you upright this tooth, the mesial distal space now is much larger than a normal molar tooth. And so it's an ideal situation to put a wide body implant, even though that it's not an, a, an immediate or an extraction site. And so this is what we did. We put in a wide body implant. You can see that this molar had been uprighted. I have a longer space here. I have a very large healing abutment in the space. And this is the day of implant placement. And then Dr. Morris made a very nice crown yeah, in this space. That was an easy, easy circumstance to restore. Yeah, very nice. So it's a, that's a healed case. We also use it in a concept called an emergency implant. Uh, what we mean by that is that some patients that you know have a, acute trauma, a uh, fracture of the tooth, acute trauma to the tooth, a non-restorable tooth. The patient needs the tooth out uh, without much treatment planning. They're referred and we're able to put an immediate implant in that day. I'll illustrate that with a couple of cases. This is a patient that went to see her general dentist for a endodontic, a root canal procedure. And unfortunately, they, they suffered a perforation through the furca, which again is gonna make this tooth non-restorable. And if we don't do something quick, the patient's gonna have a lot of pain from this. So the patient was referred right after this happened to my office for extraction. You know, she came in with a tooth that day and she expected leaving with a tooth that day, um, uh, just with a root canal a treatment, but now she needs an extraction. So to make this a little bit easier on the patient, we offered her an immediate implant. And so that's what we call an emergency implant. We placed an immediate implant in the extraction site. That's what it looks like on the, the day of uh, surgery and that's the restoration. Another case for an emergency implant, this is a patient that woke up in the morning having a full first molar tooth. She ate some breakfast with something hard, I don't know what. Some granola. Some granola. It's terrible. And she cracked, the, she cracked the top of her tooth off and again went to her dentist, it's non-restorable. She had a tooth that day and it'd be nice to be able to give her something and speed up the process. And so again, she had an immediate implant on an emergency basis. And it's a, it's a nice thing to be able to offer a patient with that. So those are the indications for wide body implants in the posterior uh, maxilla and mandible. And there's a lot of indications. And now we're going to talk about using this in the anterior. So a lot of conversation now about Inverta and uh, about a body shift implant. And this is another game changer. Uh, it's absolutely spectacular. It's great. Uh, we've had the opportunity to uh, use this in uh, the restoration and replacement of central incisors, lateral incisors, and uh, in premolars actually as well. In the floor arch cases. In both floor arch cases, you, you let it out, but we're so, gonna show that too. <laughs> we're gonna show that too. <laughs> so, but this is really a, an amazing implant um, on, on a lot of levels. Um, I know that this has been discussed and I know that it's gonna be discussed next week as well. Um, uh, but uh, the, the idea of having a wide base to the implant that it gives, it, in incredible primary uh, stability and insertion torque. And then to be able to uh, graft in the gap distance and help support the uh, bone and soft tissue for an emergence. Uh, we uh, always, our goal is to try to put a provisional restoration mm -hmm. on an implant if we can in the anterior. 
And this implant has given us the confidence to know that when we go into a case, uh, generally speaking, more likely than not, we're gonna be able to put the provisional restoration on. And so that's been uh, a big, big, big change. Um, it, it's an immediate, uh, an implant that's uh, a great immediate uh, placement. We also use it in healed sites now, uh, but initially we didn't. So right. initially it was uh, just placed in extraction sites. And again, uh, we can angle correct with it. Uh, with with uh, co uh, It coaxial. comes in a coaxial. Yeah, and straight uh, as well. And so we've, in one of the cases we'll show in a couple of minutes, we use both. So, and this is another one of our uh, patients who uh, has uh, uh, evolved to moving to Florida in the winter. Mm -hmm. And uh, she came in, uh, she's 79 years old. Um, tooth number nine is, uh, is, 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 is on its way, but tooth number eight has definitely um, failed. And so in this case, uh, because of the, uh, her travel, um, the, the requirements and, and her uh, absolute uh, dislike for removal of prosthetics. Uh, tooth number nine was provisionalized with a cantilever to eight. Dr. Steinberg extracted eight and grafted the site. And when she came back from Florida, uh, we went ahead and planned her for two dental implants, one at eight and one at nine. And so here you can see the planning process and there's my radiographic guide. You can see, look at the, the, the beautiful uh, volume of bone that was uh, grafted. So we know that we can get a, a nice coaxis implant here with the screw coming through the cingulum and incisal edge. And we've got that plan for both sites, but at nine, we're going to plan Inverta, and eight, we're using coaxis. Inverta, because we're using an immediate implant to number nine, and number eight is a healed site, so we use just a regular coaxis. So we met, um, and this is the progression of the case. Uh, so here's her initial presentation. Uh, Dr. Steinberg placed uh, coaxis at eight, and inverta at nine, and I made provisional restorations. Mm -hmm. So you can see with the provisional restoration, here's one of the things that I love about subcrestal angle correction, and I think this x-ray illustrates it better than anything else I've seen. This, this implant and this tooth are gonna have a unique path of insertion. She has some rotation, and so Dr. Steinberg was able to rotate and time the platform of the implant so that the long axis of the screw uh, draw, draw into the implant and the platform are going to be parallel to the, the rotated of insertion of the rotated tooth. And then number, uh, number nine, number, uh, number 10 is a more straight tooth. So number 10, the angle and path of insertion is more uh, co uh, coincident with the long axis of 10, yet these two implants draw together ideally. So that's one of the, one of the great things about this. And right now we're waiting for her uh, to come back uh, from Florida so we can make the final restoration. I know David in his introduction talked about, uh, uh, you know, the state's coming back online. We're still not quite sure when we're going to be back running. We have no idea. So anyway, when she comes back, we'll get her finished and hopefully, uh, well, I, I will be able to, we will be able to show this case in uh, November in South Africa. So how has this changed our practice? And, you know, one of the things that, uh, that we wanted to do is see if we could figure out a metric or some sort of uh, measuring stick as to what this has done, this, this change in the way we've been uh, treating our patients with our, our relationship with Southern Implants and the products that they, that they provide us. Uh, so we looked at this from many different aspects and we'll look at the first one. So if you take a look at this uh, graph here, this is uh, the growth of screw retained restorations in prosthodontic practice. Now I know a lot of uh, restorative dentists have been using screw retained implant restorations for many, many years. In, in my practice, we've done a lot of custom abutments and a lot of cemented crowns. Uh, and, a lot, and, and it just had to do with the way we had planned our cases. And that was standard operating procedure for us. What you can see here though, we, we visited uh, Irene first in 2015 and we started using uh, the products. And you can see uh, from 2016 to 2019, a significant increase in screw retained implant restorations. And so a lot of this uh, that you see here represents growth. Um, these are new cases uh, that, we've, that we've been treating um, and we're seeing a decrease in uh, the level of uh, uh, custom abutments and cemented crowns and an increase in screw retain crowns. The next thing we looked at, um, let's go back one. So the next thing we looked at then was, you know, how am I referring cases uh, to Dr. Steinberg? And these are for molar uh, teeth extracted and replaced with implants. So um, if, if in 2015, when we were working together, I would send a patient for a tooth extraction and bone graft. And so you can see 2016, 
to 2019, that number is decreasing significantly. And I think the reason that this is happening more frequently now is if the tooth is severely infected or you're not able to get primary stability right. and, and, and you're grafting. But, but it's a paradigm shift in my practice because the way I make the referral now is for a tooth extraction and an implant placement. And you can see significant growth uh, from 2016 to 2019. And you can also mm -hmm. see that's resulted in an increase in single tooth implant placement. Um, one of the things, you know, as, as a prosthodontist, I see all sorts of cases. I see very simple things and I see very complex things. And one thing I, I, I've noted is that the complex cases all started with a single tooth being lost at some point in the mm -hmm. patient's life. So if we can convince a patient to replace that single tooth now instead of allow that case to become complex, uh, it's going to be better for them. It's going to be better for us. The casework will be a lot easier. And I think that's what we're seeing here is because of this, it's becoming much easier for a patient to, uh, uh, to, get, to get their teeth restored with implants. What that's resulted in is, is growth in both of our practices. So if you take a look at the blue line, that's growth in prosthodontic uh, practice. And that's, that's a, from 2016 to 2019, that's almost a doubling of, uh, this, of, of implant, single tooth implants being placed or number of implants. And in the surgical practice, you see a significant jump. And that's all because I'm doing a lot more immediate implants. And we looked at this in terms of duration of case, and this has shortened the treatment time for most of our cases. If you look at 2015, this is right, before, well, it's just after we came back from South Africa and learned about these immediate implants. You could see that 82% of my cases took longer than six months. And I'll explain to you why. Even on a single tooth replacement, if I do an extraction and a bone graft, I do an extraction and bone graft, I wait four months for the bone graft to heal. The patient comes back in four months, we take a radiograph. If everything is okay, they get an implant and I wait three months for the implant to integrate. So that's seven months for a single tooth implant case. It's a seven month process, it's over six months. 82% of my cases took over six months. But if you look at 2019, it's almost a 50-50 split. Um, and the reason why this is shortened treatment time is I put a lot more immediate implants in. I don't have to wait the four months for the bone grafting. And even this 52%, this may seem like a lot, but we do a lot of full arch or more complex cases. And of course, they're going to take a little bit longer. Now, in prosthodontic practice, this has done the same, it's the yeah. same result. So in, in my practice, uh, in 2015, 74% of the, of the cases that I treated took more than uh, six months. And 26% now. Uh, or I'm sorry, 26% took less than six months. And if you look at 2019, over 50% of my cases uh, were, um, were under six months in treatment and 43% were greater than six months. And I would venture to guess that uh, this number, the 57% the would be higher in my practice had we not have patients that travel uh, during the winter. So um, it would be interesting if, if, uh, to, to take a look at that as well. And then we also looked at this from case acceptance rates. And uh, if you look at this, uh, both in the prosthodontic area and in the oral surgery area from 2016, 2019, it's steadily been going up, up, and up where patients are uh, accepting cases. And what this graph actually means is that more people are saying yes to our treatment plans because we're able to offer a, a shorter treatment plan sort of less complicated treatment plan and sometimes less expensive treatment plan because we obviate the need for a lot of bone grafting and some more complex procedures. So more people are saying yes to our treatment. And so this was probably the most fun uh, thing to look at. So uh, from 2015 to 2019, uh, we wanted to look at uh, each individual area of the mouth and try to determine uh, what the, um, what, what, what the, uh, uh, the impact has been. Uh, in terms of uh, practice growth or, or how many cases we've been uh, treating by tooth position. So from 2015 to 2019, uh, maxillary, mandibular, central, lateral incisors, uh, we see a growth of 350% in central incisors and 147% in lateral incisors. And we think a lot of that has to do with coaxis and inverta. And then if you look in the maxillary, mandibular canines, uh, same thing from 2015 to 2019, we see 88% growth in the canine region and 147% growth in the premolar region, and that we attribute to uh, coaxis. And the molar region 
you know, yeah. I mean, this is obviously. Yeah. If you look at the maps. molar injury, there's, as I said earlier, I almost never put in immediate implants in the molar for a lot of reasons, particularly the potential for nerve damage. But since the, we've been incorporating max into our practice, uh, almost every molar extraction now becomes an immediate implant. So we had a, a 12,400% increase in immediate molar placement because of this implant. It's remarkable. It's remarkable. Uh, we also use it to great advantage in full arch cases. And, and as, as we also use um, coaxes. We use every, in full arch that. cases, we, we incorporate almost that every again. one of the Southern Implant Catalog. Yeah. And with that, and we'll show a case that illustrates that. So this is a patient of ours who, um, she had some existing implants. She had uh, advanced caries due to radiation. And she uh, was actually treated, uh, she was in the midst of hyperbaric oxygen treatment. We sent um, her for that. We sent her for that. Um, so we, she was recently treated. The, uh, treatment, the treatment plan, plan though, was to extract all her remaining teeth. She had uh, implants, three in the maxilla, one in the mandible that we decided to maintain and leave for her. Really but we amazing. wanted to do full arch restorations around that. So if you take a look at what we did, uh, we have uh, coaxis inverta in the maxilla. Uh, we have straight inverta in the mandible, a max in the mandible, and then we have the three previous implants that we'll incorporate into the treatment. We use every one of the um, uh, Southern implant catalog here, except for maybe a Zygam uh, in that. And we use these inverta for full arch case on an immediate basis. We use the max here. The, the advantage is that these implants go in with such high insertion torque. These inverta went in with 70 newton centimeters torque. The max goes in with 70 newton centimeters torque. And this was already an integrated implant. Uh, Dr. Morris could have just done the final restoration on that day if he really wanted to. It, it, you know, it used to be we go into these cases and, you know, I always had my plan A and my plan B. My plan B was to reline a, a, a denture. And with Inverta and, and Max in these cases, um, you know, my, my, my plan B is a distant plan B. I have so much confidence in these implants going in with high insertion torque that I feel very confident in provisionalizing them. Yeah. So I, I think we presented today a little bit about how these site-specific implants have changed our practice improve the outcomes that we have and able, enable us to offer uh, very innovative solutions to patients with complex problems. And so, so with that. So with that, we'd like to say thank you thank very you. much. And now that we're done. We have to go back to social distancing. We've so. got to put our masks yeah, on. Yeah, you know, but uh, anyway, um, we, uh, we appreciate uh, your attention and hope everyone stays uh, safe and healthy. And we'd be more than happy to answer any questions. So we're going to answer questions. I got to stop that and I got to turn on the question and answer. There we go. Okay. Here's a question. So, uh, and so the question is, do you ever uh, temporize uh, uh, posterior wide bodies? And so um, at, at this point, uh, we have not uh, done that. I know that the, that is being done in other uh, parts of the world, but uh, in our practice, we haven't started doing that yet. Um, next one. Nice presentation. A quick question. Your upper right one, upper left one case. Why didn't you use inversa on both sites? Uh, in, hi in hindsight, in hindsight, we should have used inverta in both sites, but the pro the protocol at the time was to use inverta in extraction sites, and yeah. so since we had a healed site and an extraction site, that's why we did it that way. If I had to do it again today, I would use inverta on both sites. That's a great frankly. question. The the protocol initially for inverta was for immediate implants. And because one was a healed site, we chose to use a regular coaxis. But if I had to do that again today, it would be both in Virgo. Uh, what type of bone? Bone grafting. Bone grafting do you use? Uh, I typically use um, uh, demineralized freeze-dried bone. Um, I'm sorry, mineralized freeze-dried bone for just all my cases. I do not use xenograft with that. Okay. Bone grafting not printing. That's a nice comment. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, we'll yeah. answer that one. Nice job, you guys. The buckle. Um, in, in terms of the buckle gap, 
the, the protocol when you place a max implant, you, you really do want a, a, at least a one to two millimeter buckle gap. When, you put, when I put in a max implant, or when anybody puts in a max implant, I expect to have at least 70 newton centimeters of insertion torque. It puts a lot of force on the walls. You don't want to put that against a thin buckle wall. And so we always, the protocol is to always leave a, um, a two millimeter, one to two millimeter gap uh, with the max implant. You don't want to press against the buckle wall. There are times that I do put bone grafting in, but most of the time it's not necessary. We don't, on a max implant in a molar, we typically don't really buck, uh, bone graft the, the buckle gap. I do on inverter, sometimes in the anterior maxilla, and that's more for tissue support. Yeah. Okay. So the next, um, so there's many connections. Uh, but do I have a preference? Do we have a preference with coaxis or inverter? So that's a great question. Um, I'm, we've, we've restored all, or I've restored all of the uh, different uh, uh, connections. And um, I am, I, I don't have a preference. I've had good results with all of them. The uh, one place that I would say uh, with coaxis, so uh, I'd prefer uh, an external, uh, it, for, for full arch cases, I would prefer an ex, uh, the external connection or Provada. Um, but otherwise, for single tooth applications, I'm happy with any of them. It, it, it really doesn't matter to me. Yeah, and I, my choice is based on the restorative dentist, whatever they, they're comfortable with. However, having said that, some of the, the more narrow implants are not available in Provada. And so if I need a coaxis that is a, a 3.5 millimeter diameter, we have to go to an external hex. And I have absolutely no concern about that whatsoever. The, this this external hex, I've not seen any screw loosening issues. Um, I, I, you know, I think I think those problems have been solved. Right. Would you place a coaxis implant in the palatal canal of an upper molar because it's a good site? Um, no, in an upper molar, I would place a max implant. Uh, placing a coaxis, they they are narrow. Uh, implants, and there's no reason to place that in a molar site. Also, I think it might create a, a, a concern with uh, tissue or food trapping on the buckle, so. Mm. Okay. Do you have bone grafts in immediate implants? We, we answered that about that. Yeah. Do you graft with inverter in the buckle plate? We, we answered that. Do you yes. graft with inverter in the buckle plate? Most of the time we do add bone, and it's more for soft tissue support. Because uh, that buckle gap would fill in. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank Superb you. presentation. Do you think an angled implant in the thin wall? So uh, the question: Do you think that uh, in angled implants, the thinner wall of the implant, where the tip of the screw comes close, is too weak, and there's a risk of fracture of the implant? So that's a question we all asked uh, when we met with the engineers in South Africa, and uh, they have studies that show that. Uh, there, there really is, uh, the, the, the implant, because of the, the titanium that's used, is uh, uh, much stronger uh, than uh, many others. And the, uh, the risk of fracture in those implants, I think, is uh, minimal. I, I've never heard of it, and uh, I know that's something that they've tested extensively. Mm -hmm. Nice to see you. Thanks. Nice, nice to see you, Gary. To see you. Okay. Okay. Uh, X-hex is easier to bypass for full arch. Yep, that's absolutely true. It's easier to bypass uh, in, and, and not go with an, an intermediate abutment uh, if you have external hacks, that's absolutely correct. All right, I, I think that's all our questions. Well, thank you again. Uh, it'll be uh, not wonderful to be able to see everybody in person. Oh, here's another one. Oh, yeah. one, one last question here. One, So that's a great question, Greg. In, in, in that one particular case, um, there, uh, the, the implants, um, the one that we just showed, uh, were adequately deep for us to reuse them. So um, it, had they not been, we would have had to remove them and place new implants there. We, sure. we do have cases where we have to remove the implant, and I have to do an alveoloplasty and lower the arch for more into our space. Yes. But in this case, that wasn't necessary. Yes. Mm. Yeah, gentlemen, I've got I've got a couple of questions for you, and not getting getting away that easily. Um, <laughs> Dr. Steinberg, um, are you concerned about over talking uh, and causing necrosis or pressure on bone? Yes and no. Um, 
a lot, a lot of people, typically when we put in a max implant, I'm looking for 70 newton centimeters of torque. Matter of fact, if I don't have, it, I don't have that, I don't feel comfortable. Um, so a lot of people would consider that over torquing, but it's really not. But there is, there is a limit to that. I mean, there are people who will torque this over 150 newton centimeters. And at some point in time, uh, you, you may cause some damage to the bone. But what, at the levels that we're talking about, a lot of people consider that over torquing, but it's really not. And I know that because we put in a, a, a lot of inverter and a lot of max implants, at, at what, what most people would consider very high torque. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There's um, lots of studies currently as well done by, at Ghent University with the circumference or the diameter of the implant and that pressure on the bone correlates to a, a lot less. Um, so you're reaching very high 150, 180 because of the wide diameter and the friction rather than actual pressure on the bone. So um, yeah, I, I do tend to agree with you. Uh, Dr. Morris, one uh, question for you. For your full arches, do you prefer working on a um, a transmucosal abutment, a compact conical multi-unit abutment, or do you do you go to platform platform level? So uh, that's a great question. Under uh, most circumstances, I like to use the compact conical. Um, however, if I have a reduced restorative space, I would be more than happy with an external hex to go directly to the implant. So I think it's a, a restorative space option. But um, uh, since I'm not using angle correcting abutments, the compact conical abutment works beautifully for me. Okay. No, thank you very, very much for a uh, wonderful presentation. Those, uh, those stats that you pulled from the practices over the four or five years that you've, uh, it's incredible. Um, uh, and you know, I'd like to you know, obviously thank Graham and his, his clever engineers for all these site-specific implants. Um, and that is our aim. Um, we get asked a lot of questions, why, why generate self, you know, these site-specific implants? You, you're adding to your inventory, you um, keeping machines running, but our, our answer is that it's to, to, to be able to produce something for you to utilize in, in, in helping your patients. Um, a, a lot of my question, answers is usually around, around golf and uh, professional golfers have, have four, uh, four wedges in their bags um, mm -hmm. because they know those wedges are gonna make a big difference to their scores. Um, you know, the average golfer, aka okay, myself, uh, you know, we tend to hit the the ball in the teeth with one single wedge, never mind making a difference to my school, but professionals, uh, as, as the two of you are, and, uh, and the industry, they, re they need these additional tools uh, uh, to help, um, help treat patients uh, more effectively and, 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 in, and in doing that, help grow your practices. Uh, so I found those, uh, those stats extremely fascinating. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank everybody for joining us today. Mm. Uh, again, big thank you to Dr. Snyder and Dr. Morris. Um, really appreciate the time um, taken out uh, and and chatting to us and and running through your cases and and uh, and practices. Really, um, I'd just like to remind everyone: next week's webinar and get the information is by Dr. Barry Levine. Um, Dr. Levine has worked quite extensively with. Um, anterior aesthetics, uh, his, his dermal apron technique, if you haven't heard it, I'm sure you all have, uh, you, you've got to log in to that novel uh, to mid-facial tissue preservation um, with immediate anterior implants and um, Dr. Lean has been um, in the forefront of the beta testing group on, on inverter uh, and, and will be another great presentation. Uh, in saying that, I know we've got about 170 viewers around the world tuning into you. Uh, and for joining us. Uh, and please stay safe out there. Um, get prepared. We've got a, our inventory is massive in the in the office and we're ready and waiting for you when, when things get back to normal. Um, I wish everyone a, a, a pleasant further day and we will see you next week. Bye.